Hi, my name is Leandro Facchinetti and let's write some code together, shall we? What we have on the menu today is a continuation of the previous episode, a bunch more tapas, small effects, a bunch of them, utility effects mostly, some um, useful effects that you would not find in Reaper by default, and we are going to go through them, not only showing you how to program the effects, but also how and why you would want to use these effects in real project. So let's get started with, uh, we are going to cover um, mid-side encoding and decoding and gain and phase inversion and an enveloper and a rectifier in two flavors, half wave and full wave and a limiter in a very simple form, just a hard clipper. So let's get started with mid-side encoding and decoding. If you have never heard about this idea, it, there is a Wikipedia article for it and it's uh, about stereo signals. And usually a stereo signal is something to play on the left speaker and something else to play on the right speaker. But that's not the only way to transmit stereo signals. There is this other way called mid-side stereo coding. And the idea here is that one of the channels is not going to communicate one of the, the, the information that goes to one of the speakers, but one of the channels is going to communicate what is a, effectively a mono mix down of both channels. And then the other channel, so that's what is on the center of your stereo field. And then the other channel is going to communicate what is different between the left and the right speakers so that you can recreate the original signal. So this encoding and decoding is completely lossless. And we will try to show this using the effect we created last time, the null tester. We are gonna try to prove that we can encode and decode and get back the original that we started with. And the idea here is if you have a mono signal that is a combination of the left and the right channels, then there are some things that you can do to this signal. First of all, if you want to, you can process this signal differently. So you can split your left and right into mid and side. And then you can do things like equalization compression just on the mono channel, just on the center of your stereo field. And then you will have that effect, that equalization happening only in the center of the stereo field. And then on the sides of the stereo field, you can do a different kind of processing, maybe some other EQ curve or something else. And there is also some usefulness to mid-side uh, stereo coding in broadcasting and you can just broadcast one of the channels. The, the Well, you broadcast both channels. You broadcast both the mid and the side, but if there is some equipment, maybe on the receiving end, that doesn't support multi-channel, it's mono only, it's going to pick up the first channel, which is the mono signal, and you are not going to lose any information in terms of if there is some material that is only happening on the right ear, then even equipment that doesn't have support for stereo will be able to reproduce that. Of course, it will reproduce in both speakers equally, but it will reproduce it. You will not lose that information completely. So some, broad, broad, some broadcasting equipment uses this, uh, this mid-side encoding uh, when transmitting the data so that it's more backward compatible. And here in the Wikipedia article, there is the formulas we are going to use to convert from regular left and right to mid-side and then back. So let's get started here in Reaper and we are going to create a new effect, but first of all, I'll not make the same mistake as last time. I'm going to start by muting the master. And now let's create a new effect. And we'll call this one mid-side encoder and now this one will not be as some of our other effects that are multi-channel this won't be multi-channel now i'm going to bring this new effect here into a track and i am going to get rid of the boilerplate and we'll get started so the idea here is that you have a left channel that is 
sample zero and you have a right channel that is sample one. And let's come back here to the Wikipedia article for the formulas. So the mid is just the left plus the right. And that is the middle of the stereo field, which is the thing that we are going to transmit on the first channel. So it's just the left plus the right. And then the side is the left minus the right. So the side is the left minus the right, subtracted by the right. So the idea here is that we are transmitting the center of the stereo field and just the sides of the stereo field, which is what is different between the left and the right channels. And now we want to actually output the mid and the side. And now we need some kind of stereo channel to test this out. So I guess I'm going to uh, apply the same trick we used last time of having two different sine waves with two different frequencies in both ears. Uh, so let's recreate that setup by creating two tracks that are children of the parent track. And we are going to put a tone generator On this one, this is going to produce this node and it's going to be just on the left. So I'll take this, pan it to the left. This I will pan to the right. And I'll grab this effect and I'll bring it here, but I will change the node. So it will be this node. And now here I will lower the volume and I'm going to unmute the master track. And you can hear the signals. They are different notes, different sine waves in different ears. And now the effect is already here, right? Okay, I just figured what my problem was. Uh, the effect was already there and I couldn't hear it. And that was because I had the wrong block of code here. I don't want to run this code when you are changing a slider. I want this to run this code on every sample. So now I saved it. And now we can use that th those stones to test out the, the mid-side encoder. Though it isn't really meaningful to hear this. We just want to hear that the sound changes in some way. It isn't really meaningful to hear mid-side encoded material. You are supposed to process it in some way, maybe transmit over uh, with a broadcast, or maybe you do some kind of EQ, and then you decode it before you hear it on your ears. In fact, because you are adding the left and the right channel, and the left may be, it, remember, the left channel is, be, is encoded it's a number between minus one and one, and the right channel is a number between minus one and one. So this could be uh, a number between minus two and two. So you are doing some kind of processing, but it, it really doesn't translate to audio. Not really. You first have to decode it. But I want to make sure that at least I am affecting the signal somehow, that we will be able to hear a difference. So let's uh, turn on the master and I'll bring up the volume and then we will turn this on and off and we'll see if we hear any difference. Yeah, and we can hear a difference. So it's doing something and it's in, in fact increasing the volume. At least I think it is louder when I turn it on. So this is the encoder part. And now you may want to put some kind of EQ here that is only affecting one of the channels. So let's just bring in some EQ. And of course, many EQs will already have a setting to do mid-side EQ for you. But you could come here to the in and is in, ins and outs of the plugin and you could change so that the first channel is going to both channels in the, the, the plugin. So now this is only affecting uh, channel number one which is your mid. So this is only affecting mids. And similarly for sites. Anyway, the, he the, the idea here is that we'll be able to encode and then decode back. So now let's create another plugin and I am going to call this 
the mid side decoder and I will get rid of the boilerplate and this time I'll get it right and I'll say that this is going to run on every sample and let's get back to our Wikipedia article and look at the formulas. So now we have the mid and the side. They, the sample zero and one are mid and side. And these are the form formulas we can use to get back to left and right. And in fact, if you want to prove that this does work, then you can just take these formulas and plug into these formulas and see what comes out. So uh, we'll get to that, but first let's just implement this. So the left is, First, let's get the mid, which is sample zero, and the side, which is sample one. And then the left is, I wonder if I can put Wikipedia here and if we can see everything at once. Yep, good enough. So now we know that the left is the mid plus the side divided by two and the right is the mid minus this side divided by two. And then sample zero is going to be left and sample one is going to be right. And I guess you could just, you could just use sample zero here and here and the code would be slightly shorter, but it doesn't matter. I think it reads better this way. So now that we have this, uh, oh, the thing you could not do is just replace every occurrence of what should be sample zero like this, because then when we get to here, sample zero is already changed. Anyway, we talked about something similar to this in the previous episode. So now we have the mid side decoder as well. So we put the two right in front of one another, the encoder and the decoder, and we should get back the signal that we started with. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to do a setup to prove that the mid-side encoder and decoder are, reprodu uh, are getting back to the original signal, and we are going to use the null tester to prove that it's doing the right thing. So here's what the setup is going to look like. First of all, I'm going to create a new track here and move the effect, the, the mid-side encoder and decoder combo to this other track. And I'm going to route the signal from this track to this one. So now there is some signal here that is unaffected and there is some signal here that is encoded and, and then decoded. And I'm going to create yet another track Again, I guess I need to start naming these tracks because it might be confusing. So this is the left scene, the sine wave. And this is the right scene for the right sine wave. And this is the combined stereo signal or the stereo signal. And this is the encoded, decoded, stereo signal and this is and here we are going to do the null test and I don't want to hear the the encoded decoded stereo signal and the original stereo signal I guess I'll call this the original stereo signal I don't want to hear them what I do want to hear just is just the result of the null test, or actually I may want to look at it. So first of all, let me make sure that the, yeah, the master is still muted. And I am going to come here to root and I'm going to disable master sam. So now I should not hear anything, even if I disable this, if I disable the mute on the master track. Okay, I, I, I enabled it back. Now I'm going to route the signal from these two tracks to here, but the null test, remember from the last episode when we created the null tester, it needed more channels. So now I need four channels on this track for the null test. And I guess it makes sense to put all these as children. It makes, I think it makes sense to have it this way. So I want the signal from 
the, the original signal, the unaffected signal to come here. And I do want this to be on uh, channels one and two, but I also want to send the signal that was encoded and decoded to tracks, to channels three and four. So now we have Channels one and two are the original stereo signal. Channels three and four are the encoded and then decoded stereo signal with our new effects. Now I can put the null tester here on the parent. And we get perfect silence. See, the bars are over. We can come here and we don't hear anything. So we are exactly reproducing the original signal. Now, of course, you may get some signal coming through and it will be super, super, super quiet and you won't be able to see it in these meters. But it may be the case that there is some floating point arithmetic error in this process of adding, subtracting, dividing by two and so on that happens in all these formulas. And you may be getting some very, very, very quiet noise. I'm talking about minus a thousand dB. Very quiet noise, but you may be getting some floating point arithmetic error or really double arithmetic error because we are talking about doubles here. Um, and this is something I guess I didn't mention, but when you're writing JS effects, you are working with doubles. That is the, the kind of number that you were working with. So. There is just very, very small noise in this encoding and decoding. You can completely ignore it, but we did it. The encoder and decoder is done. And with that, let's move on to the next effect. And the next effect is uh, no longer talking about just adding and subtracting signals. Oh, and before we move on, I said I would do this. So I want to prove that you can go back and forth and come back to where you started with the formulas. So I'll copy the formulas from here and I'll come here to this editing window and I will add the formulas here, but I will I'll comment them out. And then I'll comment out things here just so that we do the back and forth and we prove that the things that the thing is doing what it's supposed to that it's canceling out the two operations are canceling out so the left is equal to this this formula here but then we can take the mid and the side and replace them so we can do this right well i guess i want to have everything all the deductions we are going to make, so I'm going to do it like this. Almost like writing mathematics. Oh, I should do this, and then that, and then... Um, you can note that we have left plus left, so we have two times left, and right minus right. So we end up canceling everything out. And I guess I'll do this in one more line just so we are super clear. So there you go, left equals left. And you can do the same thing for the right side. I'll leave this as an exercise to the viewer, but yeah, it cancels out. So that works just fine. Okay. I'll leave the comments there for future reference. Okay, now let's move on to something that is not just adding and subtracting signals, but actually multiplying or dividing signals. And this one, this next one is super simple. So we already covered this in another episode. We already did this, but you can multiply a signal by a constant and that affects the, the volume, the intensity of that signal. And we covered this when we talked about gain. So there is a whole episode about this and I won't go over it again. The code is here, but the idea is simple. We are taking some signal and we are multiplying by a constant, this number that was computed here. So in this operation of multiplying a signal by a constant, 
you end up changing the volume or the intensity. That is the gain plugin. But there are two things that I want to cover. First is kind of an optimization, and the second is um, an effect that you can do by uh, that uses this idea of multiplying by a constant. So the first is optimization. There is this idea, and I'm not sure that it still applies, but there is this idea that dividing is slower than multiplying. And I'm not sure this is still true of modern processors. It may be the case that compilers and processors optimize this problem away, but it is common. So if you have to do something like dividing by two, for instance, here in the encoder and decoder, or actually in the, in the decoder, we divide it by two, then it is common for people to write this instead as this, because dividing by two or multiplying by half is the same, right? You can think of half as one over two. So the, 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 the result will be the same, but the, the, some people believe, and I, I think they are right, that this is slightly slower. Dividing is slightly slower. I, th I still think it reads better, and it matches what you would find in the Wikipedia article, so I think this is better anyway. But it's just something I wanted to mention. You may want, if you are having issues because you are doing a lot, and I mean a lot of division, then you may want to try doing multiplication instead. And I added here an effect that yeah, I don't think it does anything because we already have the the uh, null test before it, so it's taking all the signal out. But we can change this, and it's going to change the volume because we are multiplying by a constant. Okay, so now let's uh, talk about another effect that you can do, which boils down to multiplying by a constant. And that effect is to invert the phase of a signal. And we have already used this when we were testing the null tester in the previous episode. And in Reaper, there is a dedicated button to invert the phase of a signal. But sometimes it is useful to have this as an effect because you may be working in a long chain of effects and you need to invert the phase of a signal in the middle of the chain. So it would be annoying to have to to use this button, you would have to have half of your effects chain on a track, invert the phase, route that track, that track to another track to continue your processing. And yeah, you don't want to do that. So I'm going to create an effect that allows you to invert the phase. This may also be useful to fix some kind of um, phase cancellation if you, are, you have stereo microphones recording the same source and they are positioned such that they are capturing that source slightly out of phase, then you may be able to fix this by inverting the phase of one of the microphones. So there are actual use cases besides null testing to, to have to use uh, a phase inverter. Okay, so let's start by getting rid of all of these because I put so many effects and so many routing shenanigans that I don't even <laughs> remember what is there. So let's start with a simple signal that is maybe a sine wave, why not? So there is a tone generator that comes with Reaper and I keep promising this, but we will create one of these and the master is still mute, muted, perfect. So I'm creating a sine wave here and I am going to invert the phase of that sine wave. So I'm going to add a new effect that is called inv uh, invert phase. And on every sample, I am going to, uh, for this one, I will make it multi-channel because it's so simple to do. So I'll do the trick we always do when we want to traverse through all the channels and create a loop. In that loop, I will run that code for the number of channels and I will increase the counter of channels by one. And then the sample on that particular channel is 
multiplied by minus one. So what is happening here is the phase of a signal is when it's going up or it's going down. So when I'm multiplying by one, something that is like 0 0.3 becomes minus 0 0.3 and something that is like minus 0 0.7 becomes 0 0.7. So anytime the wave is going above zero, now it's going below zero and vice versa. It's I'm just inverting the signal. And I saved this. So now we can test this out. And to do the test for this, I guess I will have a similar setup with the no tester. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to create another track and I'm going to move the invert phase to this other track and I'm going to remove it from here. So now we have a tone and we have the invert phase and I'm going to create a parent that will be the null test. It will have same trick as before. It will have four tracks. And then this one is going to the parent on tracks three and four. And yeah, so the original tone is going to tracks three and four. And also here, in the invert phase thing and then I'm going to invert the phase using Reaper and I expect that when I put the test uh, null tester here everything cancels out perfect so if I disable this then you get some signal but when I enable this you don't get any signal so I am using the invert phase from Reaper to prove that my effect my phase inverter is working. I can trust Reaper's implementation, so now I can trust mine as well because it is passing the null test, which as a side note here, I think is probably the closest you can get to some kind of formal testing of audio effects. I mean, there may be other techniques, but as far as I know, null testing is one of the best you get and it's only, it's only gonna work for simple things like inverting phase and some kind of channel manipulation like we did in the last episode because audio effects you have to hear the thing to, to make sure that it makes sense but in some cases when you're doing this kind of things that are more like engineering than musical then I guess you can have you can have something that looks like a unit test not really but I I, I do web programming and I do other kinds of programming with programming language theory and and whatnot and in those fields, it's common to have unit tests, formal tests. And then I started learning about audio and there were none of them. So I was like, what, what's going on? No testing, closest thing I could find to formal tests. Anyway, okay, let's move on to the next effect that I want to build. And that is an enveloper. We are talking now about a different operation on signals. Instead of multiplying a signal, or dividing for that matter, instead of multiplying a signal by a constant, like we just did in the invert phase or in the gain plugging, what we are going to do instead is multiply a signal by another signal. And that, that other signal that we are going to multiply by is going to act as an envelope for the original signal. Okay, let's see what this can look like. Uh, we already know that multiplying a signal by a number affects its volume. So now one of the signals is going to affect the volume of the other. And to test this out, I'm going to start with the test setup this time. So to test this out, I'm going to have a, uh, some signal here that is going to be um, maybe a sine wave, why not? I'll have here a signal that is a tone generator. And it's a sine wave. And I will have another signal here that is also a sine wave. But here is a trick. It will be a sine wave that is very slow. 
So we wouldn't be able to hear that sine wave, but it is able to affect the other sine wave. And this is something called a low frequency oscillator. A sine wave is an oscillator, and this is going to be a low frequency one. And I don't, I, I can't take this slider to make the signal as slow as I want it. I want it to be super slow. I want it to be so slow that I can see the meter going up and down. But here is a trick. In these kinds of JS effects, the range that you put, so when, and this is not a plugin we wrote, but we are looking at its source. And when you're writing sliders, and we did this in several plugins, when you're uh, creating sliders, you can say what is the range, the minimum and the maximum value. But what is interesting about this is that Reaper doesn't really respect this. If you come here to the text box and you type something else, like the base frequency is no longer 440 hertz, the base frequency is one hertz. The process just works. I mean, the uh, Reaper is happy to send this value to the plugin, and the plugin may do something with it. It may fail completely, but in some cases it works. So I can say something like half of a hertz, and then it's still generating that tone but it's super slow. It's acting like an LFO. It's acting like a low frequency oscillator. And now I can see the volume going up and down. And that's what I want. So this second signal, we don't want to hear it, but we want it to affect this signal. So I'm going to send it to tracks three and four, uh, to channels three and four. So I have to increase the number of channels on this track. And now I can say that it's sending to tracks three to channels three and four. So this is acting like a side chain, and this is something that you hear when you're talking about compression. Uh, one of one signal is affecting the effect. It's you is being used by the effect here in this in this track. So now we have some signal that we are generating here. And we also have the other signal, the low frequency oscillator that is coming through on channels three and four. So now we can write our enveloper and I'm going to create a new JS effect, which I'm going to call the enveloper. Maybe there is a better name for this kind of effect, but I don't know it. So that's what I'm calling it. And now I'm going to edit this. And on every sample, what I'm gonna do is, I will make this one multi-channel. So I'm going to consider that you have a certain number of channels and the first half of the channels, and it's so useful that Reaper only allows you to have a, an even number of channels. And then I can play this trick every time. And we already played a similar trick in the null tester. The idea here is that first half of the channels is going to be the signal. And the second half is going to be the side chain. So it's going to be the signal that affects it's going to be the envelope that affects the first signal. So I'm going to have the signal channel and it starts in minus one and then the side chain or really the envelope. The envelope channel starts in the number of channels divided by two minus one. What's happening here is I have for instance, in this case, four channels. So the number of channels is four divided by two, I have two, and then minus one, I have one. So I'm going to start the signal channel with minus one, and I'm going to start the envelope channel with the number one. And then I'm going to loop for number of channels divided by two. And the first thing I do in that loop is the signal channel plus equals one. So I'm just setting up the loop here, right? And then this plus equals one as well. So now to begin with, the first time we run through this loop, signal channel will be minus one plus one, which is zero. And that is the first channel of our signal. And envelope channel, which is now one, add one to that two. So two, and exactly that, that two represents the third channel in our example, and the third channel is the first channel in the envelope. And we are going to run this for number of channels 
divided by 2, so we are going to run this 4 divided by 2, which is 2. We are going to run this for the signal channel 0 and 1, and an envelope channel um, 2 and 3. And now we take this sample on the signal channel, multiply by the envelope, the sample on the envelope channel, and I don't want this, uh, so we, are, we still have here the, the envelope coming through, but I want to mute the envelope. I want so that the envelope doesn't come out of the speakers if you have some sort of multi-channel setup. So what I'm gonna do here is just say that this is zero to mute. And with this, I guess I can save this. And it is, Uh, yeah, it is running already and it's doing something, but it's still pumping here, so there is something wrong. <laughs> you know what is wrong? I put the effect in the wrong channel, I put the effect, the enveloper, I put it on this track. It should be on the other one, so I'm going to move it, delete it from here, and now we have something. So the envelope is creating the, the low frequency oscillation and then here we have the tone and then you can see that the volume coming into the enveloper is constant because that is the output of the tone but the signal coming out is pumping so what I expect to hear is that signal, that sine wave but I expect the volume to change and I'm going to bring in the mixer and I actually want to hear this one I, I didn't show you the outputs of some of the other effects because things like invert phase you won't be able to hear the effect of phase inversion that is really for solving technical issues like phase cancellation but this one actually has audible effect so i'll bring down the volume unmute and we'll hear this cool huh so this enveloper it can act like a tremolo effect of sorts and you can control the amount of the tremolo and you can control the frequency of the tremolo by controlling the the LFO by controlling the signal that is modulating the volume of the original signal so I can change this value and it will change the outputs of our uh, the, the, the frequency of the tremolo let's hear this And another thing it, that I am interested in doing is something that I think is in the world of synthesis called audio rate modulation. That's when a signal that is not a low frequency oscillator, but an actual signal modulates another signal. And I guess that is also the principle behind frequency modulation, which is a theory of synthesis. Uh, I don't know too much about this, and I will probably get into it in another future episode when I learn more about it. But for now, what I am interested in doing is just bringing up this value. What happens if I, for instance, take this to the number 10 or 20 and so on and, and move it up? I don't know. I don't know what happens and I'm interested in hearing. So let's try it. But I'll try it in a low volume. And if it gets too loud, then I'll fix it in post. Let's see. So at this point, I can still hear the difference in volume. I can still hear it as like a tremolo. Now let's bring it up. Now I don't think I can hear it as volume anymore, but it's kind of subtle. It's in the frontier between being a tremolo and being like uh, audio rate modulation, which is something that alters the character of the sound. At this point, it definitely feels like a different pitch or maybe a different timbre, but it's no longer a tremolo effect. Huh. 
So now it's just creating a different node. With this uh, frequency oscillation, it's just creating a different node. Let's move the slider. Fun stuff. Yeah, I guess this is the, the theory behind frequency modulation because I'm getting the same kinds of beeps that you would get with keyboards that are using frequency modulation. Anyway, another thing I want to do with this one because it's so interesting is to put here uh, the oscilloscope. We created this one in a previous episode. Let's put it here and zoom in. So let's bring this down again, so maybe one hertz, and we can see the wave going up and down. And we no longer hear it because I muted the track, but we can see the wave going up and down. And I, I want to zoom somewhat. So it's, it's doing the pumping in volume or in amplitude. But as I bring this value up, like maybe 10, so now it's not really pumping anymore. The and that's the value that I said is like in the frontier, but it's not really pumping. What it's doing is it's doing some pumping, yes, but it's more like changing the character of the wave. Now let's see 20 hertz. And 20 hertz is interesting because it's uh, the minimum value that is frequency that we can hear. It's the starting of the hearing hearing spectrum for humans. So now it's definitely changing the shape of the wave in some way. And as I bring this up to like a thousand, then at this point, you don't, you, you can no longer say that this is a sine wave. It's something else. It's a weird wave. It's no longer a sine wave. So our enveloper is useful for, from, for so many things, for things like tremolo effects up to these weird wave creations. And it's such a simple thing. It's a simple multiplication. That is the effect. Isn't that amazing? I find this super amazing. I, I love this. Okay, now let's do a bunch more effects, but now we are no longer multiplying or dividing. What we are going to do next is something called a rectifier. And it's a kind of distortion. And I guess people use it in things like guitars but we don't have a guitar here, so we are going to use it on sine waves. But the idea here is that we are going to distort the signal and we are going to distort it in a particular way. Let's get rid of these tracks, create a new one that is a tone generator. And now we have a simple tone again. And I'm going to create a new effect. that is going to be a rectifier. And I'm going to call this rectifier half wave. So what this does, so this one, super simple one. What I want is this. If the wave is above zero, I won't change it. But if the wave is below zero, then I will cut it to zero. That's this effect. It's a distortion. It's distorting the wave. It's distorting the shape of the wave. And I guess it gives you some kind of crunch. We'll hear it. But I definitely know what the shape of the wave should be. It should be the same above zero, but it should truncate below zero. And we'll put an oscilloscope to see it. But uh, and I will make this multi-channel as well, because it doesn't hurt. So I'm going to do the same trick again. And the sample on that channel will be the maximum between the sample in that channel and zero. Why? Because if the sample is above zero, then the maximum between that sample and zero is going to be that sample. 
But if the sample is below zero, then the maximum between zero and that sample will be zero. And this way we are getting rid of all the information below zero. Okay, save this and close. And let's put in the oscilloscope. And I want to zoom in. Yes, this works. So now when I turn off the effect, you can see the whole sine wave. But when I turn it on, you only see the half that is above zero and the half that is below is being rectified. It's truncated to zero. And I'm curious to hear this. So I want to bring the volume down because I have no idea if this is going to be loud. And I'm going to turn it off and then we'll hear it. Okay, so it is a kind of distortion and in a sine wave, it kind of makes it sound more like a square wave, doesn't do much. On guitar tones, I guess it does a lot more. I don't know. Anyway, this is a half wave rectifier. And I guess rectification also has some kind of effects in uh, electrical engineering. When I was learning about rectifiers, I could find all these things about electrical engineering. I'm not an electro engineer, not gonna go there, have no idea. Anyway, let's create a full wave rectifier. So for this one, new effect and this will be called rectifier full wave. I want to copy. Oh, this went to the master track. I don't want it on the master track. So I'll take it out. And I'll get the code for the half wave rectifier. And I'll put it here on the full wave rectifier. And I'll remove it and re-add it so that Reaper has the right name for the effect. So it will be full wave rectifier. I'll bring it here and I'll start changing its code. So the idea of a full wave rectifier is this. If the wave is above zero, keep it as it is. If the wave is below zero, then you don't truncate to zero, but instead you bring it up. You multiply it by minus one, or you if it's like minus 0 0.3, then it becomes 0 0.3. So you just take the absolute value of that sample. And let's save this and close. And let's look at this in the oscilloscope. So when I turn it off, you see the full sine wave. But when I turn it on, then the bottom half of the sine wave was brought up, reflected in the mirror. And I'm super curious to hear the effect that this has on the audio and to compare with a half wave rectifier. So there are two different kinds of distortion. How do they sound? So I'll start by turning both of them off and enabling the audio, and I'm going to switch between the two and we can hear it and we can see it as well. Yeah, so the half wave rectifier, I thought it would be more harsh because it is just making the wave completely square and flat here. But the audible effect is that the full wave rectifier sounded even more harsh to me. It sounded with more, it sounded louder really. That's what it sounded like. And I guess that makes sense because the speaker cone is moving more. So it's moving more air to our ears and we perceive that as louder, though the wave is uh, the same height. We are not making the wave taller with this effect, but it does sound louder. Interesting. Now let's move on to the final effect in this chain. We created so many of these. There is one final one. It's super simple to do, and I want to do it. It is a kind of limiter that is called a hard clipper. 
It is the simplest kind of limiter you can think of. Let's create the effect and start talking about it. Okay, I just copy and pasted the code from the rectifier to the limiter because I was getting tired of doing uh, all this on camera, so I, I just cut, but the idea here is I just copy and pasted the code, and in a limiter, what a limiter does is it prevents the wave from getting uh, on a certain level. So if it goes above that level, the limiter will do something to the wave to bring it down. And that is so that you guarantee not to, for instance, not to, to produce sounds louder than a certain dB level. That's what a limiter does. And there are different techniques for how to do it, for how to actually take the wave and bring it down. The hard clipper is the simplest technique, which is just to say, if it is above that value, then don't go there. Just if, if you say that you don't want values above 0 0.8, if there is a, a certain sample that is 0 0.9, well, it becomes 0 0.8. That is the principle be behind a hard clipper. And it is kind of a distortion, right? It's a digital distortion, similar to digital clipping, which is in most cases undesirable. But in this case, you have control over the clipper. So some people use this, I think, as the last effect on their master chain to guarantee that no peaks are ever going to go, no samples that are peaking are ever going to go over a certain value, and they don't care about the distortion. And I also hear that some people use this in things like kick drums, and the kind of distortion that it introduces is kind of desirable, and because you are in control of how much and how it's going to be applied, then it's kind of okay mu musically. I don't know. Some producers like hard clippers. So the idea behind a hard clipper is that it's going to clip, it's going to introduce that, that top, that ceiling. And I want this to be user controllable. So I'm going to create uh, a slider that is going to be the limit in dB. And it's going to start in zero, and I'm going to allow you to go to from minus 60 to, I guess, something like 6 dB on steps of 0 0.1 dB. And of course, as uh, now as you learned, this is only a suggestion, because you can always come into the field and double-click and change this value, and, and Reaper will respect that. It will do what you asked it to do. Okay. Anyway... So this is, um, I guess I should maybe call this the level, the limit, the threshold. I don't know, what do other limiters call this? I forget. They call this the limit. So I'm going to call it the limit as well. Uh, coming back here. The limit in dB. And I'm going to do the conversion from dB to amplitude. If you have no idea what this is about, then you should watch the other episode in which I do uh, a gain plugging and I explain this in excruciating detail. But the formula is 10 to the power of limit in dB divided by 20. Why? Go watch that other episode. And then the limit amplitude is now a number between... Um, it's a number between 0 and 1. Um, no, actually no, because of the limits here. So it, it can actually go above a little. Anyway, so now we have a sample and we're going to take the maximum between the amplitude limit and the sample. So, oh, not the maximum, the minimum. Oh, actually both. It depends. Okay, let's think about this. So if the sample is above 0... Then in that case, we want to take the minimum between the, the limit in amplitude, which is going to be a number like 0 0.8, let's say. So the limit is 0 0.8 and the sample is 0 0.9, then the minimum between the two is 0 0.8 and we limited the sample. But the sample may also be negative. So in that case, we want to do the opposite, which is the maximum between the minus the uh, limit amplitude and okay, I'm indenting this like this 
And I guess I need one more parenthesis to close here. Okay, so this is working. So if the sample is negative, then the minimum between the limit amplitude and the sample is going to be the sample. And then this, this will be something like minus eight. And if the sample is minus nine, then I'll take the maximum, which is minus eight. So I'm effectively clipping on both sides. Now I can uh, test this out. So the idea here is that after using the limiter, if I bring the limit down, I, first of all, will start shaving off the top of these waves and I will have a maximum value here. So I, I will be boxing the wave. Oh yeah, that's what's happening. So now it's guaranteeing that the output will not be louder than 19 dB. And we can see here on the scale that it's around minus 19. Let's bring it down to minus 30. And now the output is never louder than minus 30 dB. And the effect that it has on the wave is that it's shaving off the top and the bottom. Let's hear this and, and see what it sounds like. So as you can hear, the shape of the wave is changing, which is introducing distortion, digital distortion, and we are uh, changing the shape of the wave, but also we are changing the volume. But it doesn't really sound to me that we are changing the volume all that much because the, the distortion kind of compensates the change in volume. We are lowering this bar, but it still sounds about the same loudness, or even maybe even louder a little. I don't know, it kind of sounds loud, but it's just because of how our ears perceive sound. It has nothing to do with the amount of air that is being moved, I think. Okay, anyway, there were a lot of effects in this series. We covered a lot of ground. I mean, in the previous episode and in this one, we talked about uh, many operations, they are all simple operations that you can do with sound and with numbers that correspond to something meaningful in sound. And I coupled all these effects together because they are simple arithmetic on the samples and they all have some use. They all mean something in terms of audio. So let's go over all the effects we covered in the previous one, in the previous video and on this one, just to, to make... Uh, completion. So we started with a DC offset, which is taking a signal and adding or subtracting a constant. That's, that's the idea. In numbers, we are taking a, a signal and adding or subtracting a constant, and that gives you a DC offset. That is the effect that was useful if you, you had some kind of broken equipment or a, a broken white noise generator. You could fix it by taking the the DC, the, the the zero of the wave wasn't really on zero, it was above or below, and you can bring it up or down to compensate, which is useful to get some headroom if you are using compressors or some kind of effect that has to do with loudness. Then if a wave is way up above zero, but it's super short, then it's not really loud, but it's above zero, so the compressor will not work properly. It will think that the signal is super loud and it will bring it down and it will mess things up. So the C offset is taking a signal, adding or subtracting a constant. Then if you take two signals and add them together or subtract them, then you can do all sorts of mixing. And you take channels and you combine them. So you can go from multi-channel to mono, you can copy left to right and vice versa, inverse left and right, do a stereo mixing, and even uh, null testing, which is subtracting signals to see their difference, which is the most scientific way of unit testing audio effects. And then on this episode, we added and subtracted stereo signals to create a mid-side encoder and decoder. And then with a signal multiplied or divided by a constant, we learned that dividing by a constant is not always a great idea because division maybe is lower on some processors, but multiplying a signal by a constant gives you gain. 
if that constant is just again a slider. But if you are multiplying by minus one, you are inversing the phase of a signal, which may be useful to fix some uh, phase cancellation in multiple microphones on the same source. And it is also useful in the node tester, right? Because the idea of a node tester, subtracting signals, is like combining signals with addition, but you are multiplying one of the signals by minus one, because addition is like... Subtraction is like addition times minus one. And then if you take a signal and you multiply by another signal, you end up with an envelope, which may be useful for things like tremolo, but also for things like audio rate modulation and frequency modulation. I'm, I'm not sure I'm using the terms correctly, but you can create different timbres by multiplying signals together. Or you can just affect the volume of a signal in a certain way by multiplying signals together. And then finally, with operations of minimum, maximum, and absolute value, we created rectifiers that are distortion effects, half wave and full wave, and a limiter that is a simple limiter that is just a hard clipper. So every kind of arithmetic operation that you can do on signals and constants translates to something meaningful in audio effects. And that is the point that I wanted to make with this two video series, that very simple operations with numbers translate to something meaningful and useful in audio. That's all I have for you. It has been a lot, probably over an hour. Thank you for sticking around. Thanks for watching this. If you're interested in this kind of content, if you want to learn more about audio effects, I have a bunch more of these videos. So I'm publishing them. You should subscribe to the channel and follow along. And thanks for watching. I see you on the next one. Bye.